Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome. My name is Dr. Corinne Cash. I am a senior program staff at the Cody International Institute and an assistant professor for the Bachelor of Arts and Science in Climate and Environment program at St. Francis Xavier University in Antigonish, Nova Scotia. I received a Master's of Environmental Planning and a PhD in Planning from the University of Waterloo. I will be your MC today uh, for today's webinar, Imagining Public Spaces, Designing Safe Communities in a COVID-19 uh, COVID World. Now I'm going to ask Dr. Kevin Walmsley, President of St. Francis Xavier University, to deliver introductory remarks. Thank you very much, Dr. Cash. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon and good evening, wherever you are. Very excited to be hosting this event today at St. Francis Xavier University. And we will have over 300 participants eventually in this uh, webinar. Very excited about that. I wish you were here. It's a blue sky day. The trees are out, the flowers are out. Uh, we really are living in, living in a different world, but this is uh, certainly second best. And that's really what we're talking about today. And, and I'd like to extend a welcome from Dr. Tim Hines, our Academic Vice President and Provost, Dr. Richard Eisner, who is the Associate Vice President of Research and Graduate Studies, and Mr. Gord Cunningham, who is the Director of the Cody Institute. We all welcome you to this event, and I am so pleased to have this high-powered group of panelists with us today to talk about uh, public spaces certainly during the pandemic and imagining public spaces after uh, COVID-19. Thank you all very much for, for participating and thank you to our registrants for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Wansley. I'm now going to review the biographies of each of the panelists. Dr. Jason Gilliland is Director of the Urban Development Program and a full professor in the Department of Geography, School of Health Studies, Department of Pediatrics and Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at Western University. He's also a scientist with the Children's Health Research Institute and the Lawson Health Research Institute, two of Canada's largest hospital-based research institutes. Dr. Gerland is inter internationally known for his community-based research on the built environment and children's health issues. Dr. Jill Grant, FCIP, is a professor emeritus of planning at Dalhousie University her research has examined innovative approaches to city planning with a focus on themes such as sustainable community design, neighborhood change, new urbanism, and healthy communities. She also has a long-standing interest in the history of city planning. Dr. Grant has authored dozens of articles, chapters, reports, and five books, including her new book, Changing Neighborhoods, Social and Spatial Polarization in Canadian Cities, which was published by UBC Press in April 2020. Dr. Ute Lehrer is a full professor at the Faculty of Environmental Studies, York University. She has degrees from University of Zurich, Switzerland and University of California, Los Angeles in urban planning, art and architectural history, sociology and economic and social, social history. She was the recipient of several awards, including UCLA's Chancellor Fellowship, UC Berkeley's Research Fellowship and the American Institute for Certified Planners. She has published widely in social science journals and edited books. Her most recent book, edited with Richard Harris, looks at the suburban land question. She was the principal investigator and is the collaborator in several shirk funded research projects, including on global suburbanisms. John Fleming has over 30 years of experience in the field of city planning and design. He's the former managing director of city planning and chief planner for the city of London and served as a member of the city City's senior leadership team. Fleming recently served as vice chair of the Regional Planning Commissioners of Ontario and is currently vice president of the Council for Canadian Urbanism and co chair of the Mid Sized City Caucus. He has received multiple awards of planning excellence. Mr. Fleming is a senior research associate at Western University's Human Environments Analysis Lab and also a distinguished practitioner research fellow at Western's. Center for Urban Policy and Local Governance. Dr. Jeffrey Squire, faculty member in the Urban Studies Program, Department of Social Science at York University. He's also a research associate at the College of Business and Economics, University of Rwanda. Dr. Squire's current research focuses on the political economy of plastic packaging in the urban global south and an emphasis on Ghana and post-genocide Rwanda. Jeff, Dr. Squire is currently considering 
an investigation of healthcare waste management in the age of COVID-19 in African cities. I will now ask each of the panelists one question regarding public spaces in this new COVID-19 world that we're living in. And I'm going to start with Dr. Jill Grant. Dr. Grant, in a recent article, you wrote, the pandemic has brought inequality into stark relief. What are the issues around ensuring equal access to and rights to public spaces as we begin to live with a new COVID-19 reality? I need to unmute before I start talking. Sorry. Uh, the, the use of public space depends on um, Is anyone else having trouble hearing Jill? Jill, we can't hear you. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, I got cut off. Or am I back again? Yes, you are. Thanks. Okay. My system went out, so sorry about that. So um, access and use of public space depends a lot on people's means and their needs. And clearly, there's a lot of diversity in people's ability to have access to space. The, the, the crisis has really exacerbated that inequality, because what we have seen is that those who have their own private spaces, those who live in homes with, with yards and so on, have been able to get outside, enjoy some kind of activities in environments where they feel safe. But for those who live in dense neighborhoods, in apartments, or even worse for those who don't have housing at all, the homeless or the inadequately housed, access to open space, the safe spaces has been quite limited. For the homeless, it's been a real struggle to find spaces where they can safely um, hang out during daytime. They don't have access to washing facilities and toilets and other things that, that other people can take for granted to help keep themselves safe. Um, and they don't have access to their previous sources of income, which is to be able to ask people for some spare change around coffee shops and other places that had a lot of traffic, that traffic is gone. So for people at the lowest end of the income scale, it has been a real uh, a tragedy that they don't have places where they can go feel safe. In some cities, to their credit, they've put people up in hotels and given people housing. And that's what we really have to think about coming out of this, is how do we make sure that everyone is adequately housed so that people have a basic standard of living that allows them to keep themselves safe, that allows them to be able to go somewhere and get exercise and, and get some access to nature that our public spaces would typically provide, but can't do in times when they get locked down because of crises like the one we've been facing. Uh, thank you, Dr. Grant. I'm now going to ask Dr. Jeffrey Squire a question. Dr. Squire, many of the participants involved in this webinar live and work in the Global South. They are living in cities throughout Africa and Asia. When I hear about the strategies that we are taking in Canada to open up after lockdown, I find myself constantly questioning how similar measures are possible in countries where millions of people live in informal settlements in other densely populated communities. What do you think we will see happen in cities in the global south and what actions can people take to make their communities safer? Uh, you need to unmute, Jeff. There we go. Can you hear me? Great. Yes, we can. Thank you, Corinne, for the question. Yes, it is true that millions of people in the global south live in informal settlements, slums, and densely populated neighborhoods. What is also true is that many of such settlements lack access to potable running water. And so this, coupled with a plethora of socioeconomic, cultural, and political factors, 
pose unique challenges for populations in the global south as far as uh, COVID-19 is concerned. Now, when we look at the uh, current guidelines for mitigating risk associated with the virus, hand washing and social distancing are key and are highly emphasized. The question now becomes, how do you social distance in a crowded space that happens to be your permanent home or place of business? And also, how do you wash your hands frequently when you do not have access to running water? And so the situation is compounded further by entrenched cultural practices such as handshaking, live social gatherings, for example, funerals, festivals, and uh, rites of um, uh, traditional rites. And also, in many of these places, people eat with their hands, yet access to potable water is scarce. And so it is also true that many of these countries, they lack the resources that countries like Canada and other industrialized countries have to control the spread of the virus. In terms of what is gonna happen, I believe the jury is still out there because COVID-19 is presenting mixed results all over the place. So for example, in Africa, you see South Africa, Egypt, and Nigeria recording high cases, whereas places like Lesotho, Botswana, Burundi, and the Gambia have low cases. In Latin America, the same situation with Brazil, Mexico, and Peru with high cases, whereas um, Latin America and the Caribbean, sorry, whereas places like Jamaica, Trinidad, Cuba, and Barbados have lower rates. In the Middle East, you have Iran and Turkey with very high infection rates, whereas Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates have low rates. In Asia, it's China and India, whereas Vietnam and Thailand, they have low rates. And so it is very difficult to see what is, uh, to project what is gonna happen. But regarding what has to be done to ensure that communities live in a safe space, I believe it starts with effective leadership. Places with low rates, what we see there is effective leadership. And also there is a need to provide uh, infrastructure, you know, a little infrastructure like hand washing stations. This has proven to be effective in places like Rwanda, where even though not every place have access to water, there are hand washing stations in all over the place. And also designated safe quarantine sites. So in Trinidad and Tobago, for example, if you test the positive, you are picked up and sent to a safe site where you can quarantine you know, safely without the stigma and without everything like that. And so it, it becomes very um, uh, challenging given the constraints that they have. But I believe effective, strong and effective leadership and also what is proven to work in situations like this, and this work during Ebola, the outbreak of Ebola virus disease, is awareness raising and public education. And here it is important that uh, decision makers do not use technical jargons, but you know, translate uh, what ought to be done in simple language, in simple terms, so people will be able to understand. So in a nutshell, yes, developing countries or countries in the global south, they face many challenges, but there are ways in which these places can, uh, there are steps that they can take to ensure safe reopening. Thanks, Corinne. Dr. Swan. Uh, I will now ask uh, Dr. Jason Gilliland a question. Dr. Gilliland, you were recently named the 2019 Scientist of the Year from the Children's Health Foundation for your research and community work at identifying and overcoming barriers to children's physical activity. Meanwhile, over the past three months, we've seen many municipalities across Canada close access to public parks and recreation spaces and then recently open them up again with consequences for physical distancing. Why are public parks, parks important to children's health and well-being? How do you think we should be reimagining public parks in other areas of communities in a way that they will be safe for children and families in a COVID-19 world? Well, thanks, Corinne, and uh, thanks everyone for joining in. Um, I'll answer that first question by saying that something that most of us already know, and that's parks are important for children's health and well-being because they offer places to play and be physically active. Um, also, access to public parks and spending time in green spaces can have benefits for children's mental health, emotional well-being, and social connectedness. Um, of course, now, uh, because of the pandemic and parks and other public spaces where children uh, play and are typically physically active and build social connections, like um, especially schools. They, these have been closed to kids and this is seriously restricted to types of healthy activities in which children can participate. 
Um, and these restrictions are especially brutal for disadvantaged children uh, who have fewer supports outside of school. So um, in thinking about how we should reimagine re communities for children and families in a COVID world, I suggest there are three overarching approaches that uh, municipalities have and could use. These are educate, regulate, or innovate. By educate, I'm thinking that solutions can come from educating the public, as well as educating planners and policymakers. So for example, most municipalities have used signage to explain physical distancing and signage to close public spaces. I think this is necessary, but uh, limited thinking. I'd love to see municipalities post on those same signs info on some of the other resources available in their community. They're still open for recreation while maintaining safe distancing. Um, communities could also share this information through a searchable website or app showing all opportunities in the region, what exists where, what activities would be acceptable in which places, best times of day, what is free, and where economic assistance is available. Um, along with valid info about COVID-19, this information could also be shared with community mailers for those who are not online. All municipalities who haven't already done so should probably start by auditing their community assets and surveying residents to determine what they want. By educating themselves, municipalities can then use this information to learn where new park spaces are needed in underserviced areas or where poor quality parks need to be redesigned to make them more accommodating. Uh, by regulate, I'm thinking we need to rethink rules or bylaws around how we use public space. For example, if large crowds are making it impossible for physical distancing in certain parks, then municipalities might need to regulate who uses the park when they use it, and for what activities. Municipalities might mandate hours of certain parks or areas of parks for use by families with children only, um, or seniors only, as um, some grocery stores and pharmacies are doing. We might also temporarily uh, remove existing bylaws that are currently restricting healthy activities in public spaces. I'm thinking here about such as park use at night, or skateboarding in the plaza, or, or hockey on the street. Um, by innovate, I'm thinking about solutions that require creativity and likely some investment. Uh, for example, uh, if, if municipalities already know what park assets they have and what citizens want, they can start to make investments uh, like um, perhaps using creative installations or plantings in parks to mark spaces for safe distancing. Widening pathways for safe di distancing while walking, biking, or running. Paving pathways to make them more accessible for people with mobility challenges, adding more lighting, lighting for safety. And we really, we really need to rethink our definition of a public park or recreation space. Empty parking lots and other hardscapes are great for wheeling around and could be converted for use by kids. Many cities around the world are closing street lanes for bikes or instruct tire streets for people. When I was a kid, we played on the street, and I think it's time we reclaim our streets and our, some of our street, streetscapes and spaces for kids. Of course, there are many other ideas, and I'm sure I'm out of time. Uh, so I'll just conclude by saying that it's gonna take education, regulation, and innovation to solve our problems. Um, and yes, it's gonna take some increased spending, but these are desperate times. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gilliland. Uh, Mr. Fleming. You have written that you hope planners are ready to engage, oh, sorry. You have worked for municipalities for over 30 years and have a good sense of what's happening in terms of city planning and design across Canada. What do you think are some of the unique challenges and opportunities that cities may face in designing healthy communities as the fallout from the COVID crisis is felt in the coming months and years? Well, thanks, uh, Corinne. Um, to be frank, I think cities are going to struggle. Um, need to look at municipal finance, municipal budgets uh, to understand this. And first looking at the revenue side of things, a lot of those revenue sources that municipalities have that make them viable, make them able to do the things that they do, uh, are going to really um, have challenges. So let's talk about property taxes, one of the major resources for communities to raise funds. Well, think about all those restaurants, those businesses that we're talking about that are closing their doors as we see now. Uh, what about the offices that are going to be empty um, in, in large portion because firms have learned that uh, this kind of thing, people working from home can work 
and you can imagine how some of those core areas may be uh, uh, hollowed out. Uh, tourism, a place like Halifax, uh, with those um, uh, those uh, cruise ships no longer docking, what's that going to do to business? So the property tax piece of the revenue is going to be challenged. Fares and fees. Think about trying to make transit work uh, when people aren't quite sure whether they want to use transit and how that's going to affect the viability of transit over time. And even arenas, pools, golf courses, those sorts of things that relate to revenues in terms of fares and fees, those are gonna be challenged. And finally, the ones we don't like, fines, um, another revenue source for municipalities, those are also going down. Meanwhile, expenses are gonna go up. Uh, we're gonna see a lot more people, I believe, uh, that are gonna be looking for work, a lot more social service requirements, mental health and drug addiction issues are not going away. Uh, supply chain uh, interruptions are leading to increases in costs. So all of this is leaving a really bad soup for municipalities from a financial point of view. Uh, some of the research I've done, um, just scanning the media out there, Montreal, $350 million is what they're anticipating as a, an impact. Edmonton, over $110 million. Ottawa is coming up with a shortfall of a $1 million a day relative to their budget. And my city here in London, Ontario, is estimated about $33 million impact. So that's a huge challenge. But... There is a silver lining, I believe. There's an opportunity. Uh, first, I think the, the pandemic crisis has really led to some awakenings. First one, we can innovate very quickly. Uh, my wife's in the other room and she's teaching grade twos by Zoom. Where was the training for teachers? Where was the discussion with the unions? Where was the equipment and the, the equipment for the teachers, the children, the parents? None of that could be addressed properly, but we innovated quickly as a society and it's happening. Secondly, people are opening their minds. Uh, one of my friends who is, uh, would have been really tough to get him out of a car, he has now purchased a bicycle. It's like a moment for celebration, uh, but it just shows how people's ideas, their concepts, their culture of, of the way that they're thinking is changing. And so with this, this shift in mindset, we can apply that to our cities as well. And a friend of mine, uh, Brent Totteron, often says, if you're wondering about a city's priorities, go right by their strategic plan and go directly to their budget, and you can find out what their real priority is. And uh, this crisis, as I've said, it means that we can't do the haircut on our budgets, our municipal budgets. We're going to have to reprioritize. So we have this moment where we can reprioritize thinking differently with this sort of nimble kind of perspective and new ways of thinking about things that politically would have been really unpalatable not too long ago. So reduce the amount of, that we spend on our auto or our, our really auto oriented budgets. Uh, we should be reconsidering every single road widening project that's coming forward. We should be rededicating our resources to less expensive ways of getting around redeploying our budgets, as Jason said, for more parks and open spaces, rededicating and redesigning our existing spaces for sidewalks and uh, cycling lanes. We should be thinking harder about urban agriculture and what cities can do to grow in the spaces throughout our cities that already exist. And we should be thinking about urbanizing our suburbs so that we don't have to be set up to take the car everywhere we go. And we're seeing all of this happen, I'll conclude here. Uh, Seattle, 20 miles of street closed to traffic, uh, and that was an interim temporary measure. measure. Now they're making that permanent. Vancouver uh, Council just gave staff direction to find an 11% reduction in the amount of uh, road space used for cars that could be turned over to other uses, uh, people-oriented uses. Montreal, 100 kilometers of new cycling and sidewalk widening. Bogota, 50 kilometers of new uh, cycling lanes. And Paris, which I think is maybe one of the most progressive worldwide right now, and they're thinking from an urbanism, new city design perspective, 400 miles of pop-up bike lanes that they've established, and they have a new community uh, design model that they're uh, moving forward with called the 15 minute community. I won't get into the details, but it's all about those things that we need daily being available to us within a 15 minute walk. So these are the kinds of challenges that municipalities are gonna face. 
but it's an opportunity for us to rebuild our communities uh, with the new thinking and uh, reestablish our budgets to deliver that. Uh, thank you, John. Um, I know that you talked about um, municipalities, but many of the things that you said can actually be applied to um, this university space that, that I'm sitting on right now. How can we redesign the university, including parking, uh, parking spaces, to be more available for uh, public access? So thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to ask Dr. Ute uh, Lair a question. Uh, Dr. Lair, you have written that you hope planners are ready to engage in the negotiation process around public space in a far more radical and progressive way than we have delivered over the past 150 years. Considering the inequalities to public space that the pandemic has revealed, combined with how public space is used for protest for justice and equality, as we're seeing right now through the protests in marches for Black Lives Matters in the US and Canada, what is the role for those involved in planning spaces to ensuring that public spaces are areas where democracy occurs? What are these more radical and progressive ways that you believe must be considered in post lockdown planning approaches? Yeah, thank you very much, Corinne, and thank you for your invitation. Uh, when I accepted this invitation, um, you know, from today's perspective, it appears like a million years ago, when in real life it was only a couple of weeks. But in real life, so much has happened since then. So we can't look at public space the same way as we did just two weeks ago. George Floyd was killed in Minneapolis 10 days ago. 12 days earlier from today, the overcrowding at Trinity Bellwoods Park in Toronto took place. Both events had consequences that are directly linked to the notion of public space. The overcrowding in the park was solved by painting circles on the lawn. Circles that come with clear rules. Three people of the same household sitting or two people lying down flat. It costs about $12 per white circle line in a park that is as big as this one. More than 400 of these circles are needed, but that's still relatively little money for making clear what the rules are. But even then, since it appears to be little money with great effect, is it really necessary to spend even that, uh, even, um, that kind of money and effort on something like that while children go hungry because of the canceled school and with it the canceled lunch program? As newspapers have stated, the crowds did not show up again. And when I checked a couple of evenings ago, People were sitting in those circles, just like the planners had planned for. But what about the killing of George Floyd? Just like the overcrowding of Trinity Bellwoods Park, this event also took place in public space. A public space of a different kind though. Not because it was in the streets instead of a park, but because it is the other kind of public space. Public space is socially constructed and it is created through social practices. And in this specific case, it also shows the different dimension of public space. In the first case, public space leads to entertainment and consumption. In the other case, it leads to disenfranchisement, exclusion, criminalization, and even killing of parts of the public. This occasion here today is not the place to elaborate on these two cases, and it's also not something new. As L. Jones, a poet, activist, columnist for the Halifax Examiner wrote in the Washington Post just a couple of days ago, quote, mythologies of Canada as the promised land at the end of the Underground Railroad ignore the realities of white supremacist oppression. In 1784, a white mob armed with hooks and chains attacked the home of Black Baptist preacher David George in Shelburne, Nova Scotia, setting off 10 days of violence by white settlers in the first recorded race riots in North America. So where does that leave us now, given the question about progressive planning? 
planners of today are trained to be aware of differences in, in their constituency. There's no such thing as the public. There are multiple publics and they come with multiple ways of social practices. Public space is created, negotiated, contested and reinvented in multiple ways. But what we know for sure is that public space is lacking in neighborhoods of marginalized people. And when we talk in the COVID-19 time about public space, we ask for more and better access to parks and bicycle lanes, which are all laudable goals. Yet, when we look at the fine print, we quickly need to realize that we continuously speak about those places that are already privileged. So, why are we wanting to build, as in the case of Toronto, a park deck over the rail yards that costs us over $3 billion, when in fact we should invest into public housing and into public amenities? If COVID-19 has taught us one thing, it is that those neighborhoods where there is a concentration of poverty also have the highest numbers of illnesses and deaths. And that leads us directly back to one of the origin of our profession, taking care of health in cities. And this is why it is utmost important to focus on improving public amenities for those that are disenfranchised in our society, those that are actively kept at the margin. This means the neighborhoods and territories of Black Canadians, Indigenous people, and immigrants. That's it, what I have to say to this question. <laughs> yes, thank you, Dr. Lair. Uh, at this point, we're going to take uh, questions from the audience. If you do have a question for any of the panelists, please uh, type it into the chat box. And ideally, you can uh, address whichever panelists that you would like to answer the question. Um, I don't see any uh, right now, so maybe I will, um, I'll just ask a question to start and then others can think about what they want to ask. So uh, I am uh, currently at St. Evex University and uh, we live, uh, we are situated in this small town of Antigonish. And um, normally there's, uh, there might be up to 2,400 students that arrive um, off campus. And in, in September, uh, the decision hasn't been made whether or not we will reopen. Um, if, we, if the university reopens, it will be done safely in accordance with uh, public health. But I'm, I'm wondering, to have a, a community, a small community such as Antigonish, uh, to have 2,400 students return and to, to manage the actual, the practical, uh, the practical spatial management of how this will happen and how um, the university will have to uh, coordinate efforts with the police, with emergency services, with the local town and the county. Uh, what kind of steps can be made or what do you think are some of the most important steps that uh, decision makers uh, who are suddenly planners uh, without asking to be planners and urban designers, uh, what should they, what measures should they take as we open up? John, do you want to take that or <laughs> does anyone have it or? Um, yeah, I, I think, I think I, I'll say one thing. One of the first things that everyone has to do um, is is understand their public space their space right now understand their assets um, I, I know our university right now is going through an accounting exercise of looking at floor space per um, existing in different buildings and then uh, you know I don't it is is it a foolish exercise I don't know but trying to determine how, how many people can we squeeze into each room how many people can be in a hallway at once um, how many people can be in a residence building? Um, I'm trying to think about that myself as my daughter is going off to residence in another university. Um, and so, so I think, first of all, we have to, to figure out, well, what do we have and what do we have coming in <laughs> so, and before we can make any hard decisions? And, and I think that's why a lot of presidents uh, of universities are, are, are stuck right now. 
Um, and small towns, I don't know, I, I, you know, you were saying about Antique and Ish, I, are, are, is there enough housing? Well, I guess there is normally enough housing for, for them, but I'm sure multiple people per, per, per house. So I, I'm going to, I'm going to look to the, the planner at the, the, and, and ask has any thoughts on that one. Yeah, and, and John, I'm wondering about this coordinated effort. Um, I've been thinking a lot about integrated planning efforts. So how municipality and, uh, like I said, emergency services and public health and the university, how all these different end business, how different actors who um, probably have a good history of working together, but what kind of a coordinated, integrated effort they need to make? Well, uh, first thing I'll ask is, can you hear me okay? I'm having the yeah. um, technical issue that you always expect anytime you're using technology. Um, anyway, I, I, I think that what you just said is the first key, and that is that too often um, these different important parts of our community and the people that uh, operate them, uh, they're operating in their own silos and they're not working as closely together as they could. And it's very difficult because, again, a lot of it goes back to either politics or budget and they're trying to figure out what their constituency is looking for and how to allocate the resources. So going from an individual model of understanding um, my organization and what's best for me to more of a larger scale community model, trying to own the other organization's problem and working together to resolve it uh, collaboratively, usually with a win-win result, is really critical, really important. So those, those actors that you just mentioned, whether it's uh, police or healthcare, the recreational services, the municipality and, and all of the different elements of the university, so important for them to get in the same room, explain what makes them tick and uh, to problem solve together. As I said, I think that this crisis has really shown us that we can adapt. Who would have ever thought that, um, you know, if we go back five months ago or three months ago, who would have ever thought that we could collaborate and coordinate to try and reduce the curve, that people would actually sacrifice so much in so many cases for uh, public benefit. And uh, it's happened. And there's been extraordinary things that have occurred. So, you know, I think there's a huge amount of positive opportunity there, but it's all about people getting together, talking to one another, understanding each other's needs and uh, trying to problem solve together. And I just add that um, one of the challenges we have now, of course, is that it's really hard for people to get together to have those discussions. I think John's right that there needs to be a lot of communication in these situations and in small towns that depend so much on students coming from outside for their economy, the real local economy, it's even more challenging, but we're dealing with a situation in which communities may perceive considerable risk from a lot of people coming in from outside. And and situations in which our provinces are trying to control mobility. So that there's a lot of uh, communication that has to happen, a lot of discussion, and finding those creative ways to enable that discussion so that people feel like their concerns are heard and addressed in an appropriate way will be critical to moving forward. Thank you, Dr. Grant. Uh, I had a question come in to me privately. Uh, how do we create equitable, accessible spaces on university campuses? And although uh, the question was focused on university campuses, in light of the uh, what we're seeing right now with uh, the Black Lives Matter uh, protests around the world, and this is something that's been part of my research as well in the past, how to create really uh, uh, equitable and uh, and just kind of spaces. So uh, can you speak to how you actually uh, can actually create that, that environment? Maybe uh, uh, Dr. Lair or, or Dr. Grant or, or Dr. Squire. Yeah, I really would like to hear what my colleagues have to say. Um, but um, just quickly, I think that John Fleming said the, the two things. It all comes down to politics and budget. It comes down to priorities. And uh, when we talk about equality, equitable and just spaces, we talk about how we perceive, how we recognize these spaces, 
and what are we willing to do to move us forward. And as we know from our budgets, the city budgets, municipal budgets, um, we have priorities. And as Black Lives Matter is arguing, a lot of resources are going into the police budget. The police is trying to do too many things at once. And um, on that way, on the path, trying to do too many things at once, also killing people on the way, as we know. So in order to actually get us somewhere, we have to reevaluate the system that is in place, a system that is continuously disenfranchising people and continuously putting stigmatism on certain people. So it really starts with the budget. Um, if we wanna change something, we have to change the budget. And with the budget, that is politics. So, but I re I'm really interested what Jeffrey and Jill have to say to this question. Too. Thank you, Dr. Um, well, I, th I think that it is certainly true that we need to reconsider our priorities in the city that the crisis, the various kinds of crises that we're dealing with right now have shown us that the ways we've been dealing with things in the past don't work anymore. So we have to reconsider that um, and, and find ways though that enable us to ensure that, that people have access to the kinds of spaces that they need and that they can use safely. And uh, so that, that requires them creative thinking, some, some um, soliciting of, of ideas from a wider cross-section of people than maybe we've asked in the past about what their needs are in space. And um, so, so that means we've got to find different, a different kind of politics to think about how we organize and plan our spaces in the future, I think. Uh, thank you, Dr. Grant. Um, Jeffrey, did you want to comment? No pressure, but no? Oh, okay. Oh, I can't hear you, you're, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Hey, Corinne, can you uh, please repeat the question? Um, yeah, it was around um, how to create equitable and um, accessible spaces. And it was directed for university campuses, but I think that it's also applicable to all public space, how to actually create uh, equitable, just um, accessible spaces for all. I think what I was going to say has been touched on by the other panelists on here. But uh, one thing that I find is that COVID-19 presents unique challenges that has taken everybody, planners, decision makers, want to be planners, everybody by surprise. So it is still um, uh, a learning process that uh, we are trying to figure out as to how best uh, to navigate the terrain. So you talk about the uncertainty re regarding uh, coming back to campuses in September. We are having the same problem, whether to transfer to online courses or whether to um, uh, uh, accept students, but with limited capacity in the classrooms. But then when you do that, the question then becomes, it's not only in the classrooms where you have students, you, have the, you meet them in the hallways, you meet them outside in the food courts and stuff like that. So how do you then plan around all of this? It's not just one area that the problem is this. So I think it's a, it's a complex situation and equitable planning is key, but I don't think it's the final answer to all of that. Okay. We need to understand more, yeah. Thank you, Doctor. I think uh, John, you want to say something? Go ahead. Just really briefly, I think uh, Jill touched on this uh, as well as Jeffrey. But I, I think that um, something we as planners really need to understand is that um, we have blind spots, um, and a lot of those blind spots are not something that we're going to resolve uh, because of um, our background, our, our history as individuals, and we need to find new ways of engaging people that can resolve those blind spots that help us to redesign our cities. And so, um, for example, uh, I think Ute did a great job explaining, um, you know, the politics and the, uh, 
budgeting processes are really key for what's done in our, our cities and our campuses for that matter. But how is it that people that are disenfranchised that aren't part of that sort of institutional structure of, for how decision making and politics and budget setting are, are really done, how, how are they to express their thoughts, desires, their dreams, or even their, their needs and how the current status quo is not resolving um, or, or serving them uh, well. So that, that whole notion of new ways of engaging, finding ways to uh, uh, get beyond our, our blind spots and do a better job of ensuring that uh, communities across all demographics, all socioeconomics uh, are addressed. And of course, planners have been trying to do this for a long time, but I think uh, events of recent are showing very clearly that uh, it's not good enough and we need to continue to do a lot better. Yeah, I find myself really questioning how, um, you know, public participation is such a critical part of planning processes. So I find myself really questioning how public participation is going to be uh, uh, integrated into this post-COVID-19 planning process. Uh, we have another question. Um, how can you counter arguments that expanding size and access to public space is anti-ethical to public health goals during the pandemic? Oh. <clears throat> I'll take that one, but I'm just going to say what, what quick comment about the last thing. I don't know if we really need new ways of engaging. Um, I think we need new ways of hearing. Um, Planners always do pub are good at public participation, but I think now this has required a rapid response. COVID-19, but also the reactions to George, George Floyd, these problems have existed for a long time. And it's now the, what's happening now in the world is finally, I think, will shake up the politics to, let, to make people realize, okay, now we've got to do something about it. Um, because I, I I don't know. I, I, I think we need a rapid response and we, then we need a thoughtful response, but we need to act now. Getting, getting to the other question, um, antithetical, how do we counter that? Well, we've all been locked up in our homes and, and, and it's again toughest on the people who live in high density neighborhoods or the people that don't have financial resources to, uh, to access other um, pay for play opportunities or whatever it may be, big backyards. So, <clears throat> If we don't invest in these type of things, we are going to have public health problems, mental health problems, et cetera, that will trickle down. I think everything here, it's not about necessarily parks, it's not about investing, it's all holistic. Everything has a knock-on effect on everything else, right? So, so I guess the answer to that is we say, for, for the health of our children, for the health of our families, for the health of our economy, we need to invest in these things. It's not saying it's the only thing we need to invest in, but, but public spaces and health. Thank you, Dr. Gilliland. Uh, Dr. Squire, what approaches are you seeing in Ghana and Rwanda from governmental entities in reacting to the pandemic? What is the role of communities in keeping people safe? Um, yeah, do you wanna go ahead? Yep. In fact, both countries, they, uh, they haven't had, um, they said that other countries in Africa are having, which indicates that something is working, at least in these places. So for example, in Rwanda, uh, they implemented uh, little steps such as uh, in the main bus terminal at K in Kigali, passengers waiting to get on buses have to wash their hands before they get on the buses. And at the systemic level, the government banned large gatherings, for example, weddings, schools, and uh, uh, other uh, events to prevent the spread of the virus. And also there was a suspension that we're witnessing, uh, witnessing everywhere of commercial uh, flights um, uh, into the country. And so all of these steps ensure that they have their uh, 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 cases under control. Ghana adopted a similar approach where the two main cities, Accra and Kumasi, were shut down in the immediate aftermath of the outbreak. And so this contributed to limiting the spread of the virus and then one thing that Ghana is doing so well that the World Health Organization has uh, recognized is testing and tracing. A small country with a relatively weak um, uh, healthcare system has been able to test over 100,000 of its citizens so far. 
and not only testing, but they also do contact tracing. So they're able to trace the steps of the, of the virus wherever they are. So when you look at both uh, 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 Rwanda and Ghana, they are taking these small steps to ensure that the situation doesn't spiral out of control. And then at a community level, you know, nobody will, will believe or will, will imagine that a year ago wearing masks will be fashionable in a, in a hot climate like Ghana and Rwanda. But now everybody is wearing a mask and it is being promoted. And it is, it is not only being promoted at the systemic or national level, but at a community level where community leaders and elders are encouraging people, you know, the whole idea of uh, social distancing is sinking in right now in these places because like I indicated in my opening remarks, you have to have public education and awareness raising without a doubt. Because even in the absence of uh, running water, when people are aware that, you know what, you need to wash your hands, they'll make it happen. They'll make sure they have the water to make it happen. And so these are some of the steps that they are taking, like providing uh, hand washing stations in uh, bar stations and also contact tracing and testing, suspending all flights and stuff like that. These are the steps that are being taken to address the uh, pandemic in Ghana and Rwanda specifically. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Squire. I uh, have a question about uh, green design. How do we make the economic argument for rebuilding along a green design when the pressure will be on to just get business going? Um, oh, maybe I just say a few things before John uh, throws in his um, ideas as well. But I think that the pandemic has shown how, um, how quickly ideas can change about what the priorities are in terms of, of budgeting and uh, and so I, I think if you had suggested a, a year or so ago that people would start to think about closing down streets, which planners have been asking for for a long time and turning them into bikeways and so on, um, that people would be surprised how quickly now politicians are, are getting on that bandwagon and recognizing that it's not business as usual anymore. And um, so I, I think that the, the important arguments are to show how we can do these things differently, how we can make safer places for people. Uh, without it, a lot of it can be done without very much in the way of additional costs. Some, some will take new investments, but as Uta was saying earlier, you know, it's about changing budgetary priorities in the city and, and uh, deciding what is really important at this stage because this pandemic is not is not going to be resolved super quickly, and it's probably not the last one that that our civilization is going to experience because these things happen time and time again. So we need to we need to do some things differently, and um, and I think our governments have shown that they're willing to invest in things that I I've been surprised about how quickly um, the governments have put money into making sure that we get through this. Uh, thank you, Dr. Grant. Uh, another question, is there a set of best practices for public spaces? Uh, for example, all areas need bike paths, transit, green space, music or no music. It would be hard to advocate for better planning processes or a budget without proper end goals in mind. Uh, I, I believe that's around the question of, um, of the, ultimate, the ultimate plan, how that ultimate plan is determined. Would anyone like to tackle that? Go ahead, John. I'd just like to also just touch on what Jill was just talking about. It is amazing, I think, that um, uh, as a society, as a global society, we are we really struggle um, thinking long term. And so, uh, you know, yesterday the crisis was about housing and affordable housing and about mental health and drug addiction and um, climate. And now with the pandemic, a lot of that has been set aside uh, or at least pushed to the background. And I think what's really important is that the, the pandemic has taught us that, you know, these things that we could have thought about longer term to make our cities more resilient, which would allowed us to perform a lot better, um, we didn't do. And the same thing's happening from a climate emergency perspective. But what we do know is that when something really urgent like this pandemic happens worldwide, 
everybody responds quickly. But there's a curve that we cannot plank if we don't get on top of it soon. And that is that curve relating to global warming and climate change. And so the things that we do in response to these crises that we're dealing with today need to have that bigger picture in mind, which is the climate emergency. And that's how we, when we're setting our budgets and doing our political conversations, need to be, I think, building that green new vision. And those things that we're talking about very much plug into that resilient cities and cities that can thrive in, in climate. In terms of standards, there's no specific black and white standard for what we should be doing. Uh, a friend of mine at the um, City of London, uh, uh, Britt O'Hagan, provided me with some statistics that showed that 18% of our right of way, or sorry, 18% of our built area is right of way for streets, 18%, and only 11% is for parks. So it just shows you that we can reevaluate how we allocate the space in those right of ways for other things. And that's not necessarily an expensive thing to do. But is there a standard? No. Um, the Council for Canadian Urbanism is a good group that talks about the types of things that we should be trying to do in our communities, how we can move towards um, better designed communities from a number of different perspectives. There's others out there, community, uh, Canadian Institute of Planners, and, and many others. Um, so while there isn't a standard, there's lots of really good information out there around our end goals, and ultimately it's locally to uh, the, the role of councils to decide what is the end goal that we're striving towards as per the, the, the wishes of the community that they represent. Uh, thank you, Mr. Fleming. Uh, here's a good question from Sarah O'Toole. How can community organizations get their equity perspectives to the municipal and planning tables where immediate and longer term decisions are being made and ensure that the long term recovery continues to consider these perspectives? Uh, maybe um, Dr. Laird? Yeah. I think this is a very important uh, question, uh, particularly the second part of the question, how to actually make it lasting. And so we were talking about how quickly we respond to COVID-19, how everybody's working together. And um, so we actually see that things can happen quickly if we want to. Uh, the problem is what is the long-term sustainability of this, these public uh, engagement processes. And um, so, and you know, public transportation, high density community building, uh, you know, has been promoted, yes, but there were time periods where it was not promoted. So we have this history of urban planning where we go for density, uh, non-density and so on. So right now we have ha been in a period of increasing densities in cities and now we are confronted with the COVID-19 um, in our cities and, and we now probably will go the other extreme again um, and never really finding the middle. So um, um, to come back to the question on community building, how it should shift towards uh, to improve public health. Um, I think that some of the speakers before you addressed this, we have to go in a holistic way. It's not a one way, uh, simple solution by building more bike lanes, this and that, you know. Um, in terms of the bike lanes, I, I do have to say something that is probably unpopular uh, in general. Um, because we are actually talk about bike lanes in already, you know, well, you know, well off neighborhoods quite often. And we see those people that switch from the cars that never went on a bike and all of a sudden um, buy bikes. We see them then in their spandex outfit. Um, but what is actually done for those people that actually do need bikes for commuting purposes? where are those bike lanes in those neighborhoods and so if we actually don't look in a holistic way both in terms of health but also in terms of equity um, 
when we look at cities with density and lower density, we also have to see who has actually access to green space and where. Um, so there's a whole range of questions and I, I'm very grateful for this question, this particular question. Um, I think it is very important because it has to be kept on the table and not just answered in the next question. So thank you. Exactly, that's a great point. Oh, um, Dr. Squire, uh, turn on your mute, uh, turn off your mute. Uh, Jeff, Jeffrey, unmute yourself. Sorry about that. If I may add to what uh, Uta said, equity has always been an important part of planning practice, but it's really, really addressed in, uh, uh, in practice, okay? And so we have a situation where, you know, the need to uh, uh, engage in community planning and pu uh, public participation and stakeholder consultation are key. But then who are these stakeholders and who, are, who is being consulted in these planning decisions? So if you have a situation where a single parent has to go to work and do not have the chance to go and sit down in a public consultation forum to ventilate what their grievance or what their concerns are, how then can you take what they are feeling into consideration or how can you incorporate that into planning practice? We have the situation where we talk about transformation. I saw a question here about transformation. I believe that comes with leadership. We have uh, uh, leaders who doesn't even believe that systemic racism is an issue. So how can you therefore plan to affect people whose lives are being you know, impacted by systemic racism? We talk about bike lanes, we talk about all of these amenities in the urban environment. Yet if leaders do not believe that this is important, this has to be addressed, there is no way we can get there. So that's just I want, that's what I wanted to add. Mm, that's a critical point. Um, we are at 12 o'clock. Uh, this hour has gone by very fast. Um, there are some other questions, and um, I think that we could, we could either take one more question and go a little bit over, or we could end, and the people who um, post the questions can get in touch with the panelists directly through their email. Uh, panelists, what do you think? Whatever you'd like. Okay, let's take, let's take one more. Um, public transportation and high density community building has been historically promoted and taught as a best practice in planning. COVID-19 has challenged these ideologies in ways we had not previously seen. I'm curious as to, the, to your thoughts on how community building could and should shift going forward to improve public health, municipal finance, and quality of life. Um, maybe I could say a few things about this. Obviously, we're dealing with a density sensitive problem. <clears throat> that is that that density exacerbates the risk of, of this disease. Um, on the other hand, we, we have seen some places that are very high density that have dealt with the, the results of the pandemic very successfully, and some that haven't. So it density is only one of the factors here. I, I do think there's a big um, risk that in places where people have the means that that they will perceive that density is less safe and they will therefore like likely uh, reconsider suburban living again so I think Uda's point about the kind of cycles is is right I, I think we will see that on the other hand we need density to be able to provide certain kinds of services and amenities so I don't think we're we also have so many people in the planet that we're not going back uh, to really low density situations. So what we have to do is have better public health and cultural responses to these, these um, situations. And the point that Jeffrey made about ma masks becoming fashionable, other things where we can see that there are certain kinds of cultural responses. Right now, people, people who a few months ago would have hugged a friend on, it, uh, on a dime, now are are afraid to get too close to anybody else. So we can see very, very quick changes and what we have to work out in the next month are, are what kind of changes make sense so that we can continue to, to live effective lives in our cities because um, we're gonna continue to be an increasingly urban planet for the foreseeable future. 
Yeah, thanks, Dr. Grant. Uh, Jason, go ahead. I just want to say, please, let's not give up on density. Um, uh, some of us, you know, have been working for the last 20 years on the built environment health issues and recognize that um, the other, the other um, if we go the other way, then we have chronic disease problems, uh, type 2 diabetes, uh, cardiovascular disease, et cetera. So Jill is absolutely right that we need a public health response. We need to change our social norms and how we react to this, but we don't abandon what we've been working on doing. Um, and now, now that planners and communities and more support Arrows and they are not taking the steps. You see what is happening in Brazil and what is happening uh, to the, uh, uh, in the U.S. and other places like that. So I believe, at the same time, I believe that it is not that being uh, pessimistic or you're, you're wrong, but I think a change in leadership or leaders with the goal, with the ambition and with the um, um, uh, drive to do something meaningful is going to bring about the changes that we're witnessing. So don't lose faith in the system yet. Maybe, you know, so, sometime somewhere we're going to have the leadership uh, it requires to make things work. So don't give up hope. Okay, good words. Anyone else? Well, I just would like to say that I, I, am, I am more optimistic than I was this time last year that we will see meaningful changes. I, I do think we've seen um, in most countries some kind of a positive political response. I don't think it's been very good in some countries. I think some countries would like to put their heads in the sand and pretend this isn't happening, but their reckoning is coming for them. So um, and they think that, you know, in part, the kind of response that we've seen to the pandemic has created a context in which there's also a different kind of response to the racial inequities and injustices that we've, we're seeing happening now. I think those are related. I don't think that, um, you know, because the problems that, that are being responded to are not new, but the response is very different this time. So that does give me a sense of optimism that change is, change is coming. And it's not guaranteed, but there's better chances of doing some things differently now than there was a year ago. I just want to quickly follow up. I think change is coming, but we have to watch out in which direction the change is uh, happening. So we have to be there, we have to be on our feet, and we have to be part of the discussion, the ongoing discussion. So I'm grateful that we had this panel today. Uh, so, so thank you, not here. And, and Jill said the right things. Um, it's not all is lost. There is some aspects where we actually can improve and should improve. I, I like that. It, it's like, okay, we can be hopeful, but we cannot be complacent. So, That's right. yeah. Um, Jason or, or John, how do you feel? I'll just chime in by saying, I, I think if you look at history, see that major disruptions are what have catapulted uh, people forward in a lot of cases and society forward. And so we're looking at two major disruptions uh, going on right now that are, I would say, positive disruptions in, in some ways. And as I said in my earlier remarks, I've seen people open their minds through this, these disruptions recently, reevaluating status quo. I've yeah. seen huge um, acceptance of innovation and the whole idea that we've got to innovate quickly. So, you know, these are things I think to be hopeful of. And I agree with you that, that it's all about not just being hopeful. It's definitely not, I don't think about just being disenfranchised and, um, you know, just quitting. I think it's about as a community uh, and as an in individual really getting involved, doing whatever you can to move towards the change that you would like to see. So uh, identify what that change is and move towards it individually and do whatever you can to uh, 
to make a difference. Excellent. Jason? I'll just say ditto to everything. Change is going to come. We can't be complacent. Um, I, I have hope for the future. Um, and, and we have to make sure that people vote. <laughs> um, you know, we, we don't tend to, to see very high participation rates in our elections. And I, I suspect over the next couple of years, we're going to see those skyrocket with everything we're seeing from our politicians. Um, so let's keep at it and work together. Great. Thank you. Um, so that's reason for, for getting up tomorrow morning. Uh, to everyone, thank you for joining us today. Uh, later this week, you are going to receive an email from us that provides contact information for the presenters, a recording of the webinar, and a link to an evaluation. Your feedback about the webinar would be very, very much appreciated. I want to thank you sincerely for joining us today and, um, and, enjoy, and enjoy your summer. Thank you, everyone. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye.